Welcome to Talk World Radio, a half-hour discussion of politics as if the people mattered. I'm David Swanson. This week on Talk World Radio, we're talking about nuclear weapons and the danger they present and what to do about it with Daniel Ellsberg, who is a former U.S. military analyst employed once upon a time by the RAND Corporation, who precipitated a national uproar in 1971 when he released the Pentagon Papers, the U.S. military's account of activities during the Vietnam War, to the New York Times. Dan Ellsberg has continued as a political activist, giving lecture tours and speaking out about current events, and as an author of critically important books, and as a guest on this program and many others. Dan Ellsberg has recently published with Norman Solomon an article in The Nation magazine titled, To Avoid Armageddon, Don't Modernize Missiles, Eliminate Them. Daniel Ellsberg, welcome back to Talk World Radio. Glad to see you, David. Glad to see you. Uh, so it, it, eliminate missiles sounds very good. Is that all missiles or is there certain super dangerous ones we're talking about in particular? Well, some are even, they're all p designed to be murderous, mass murderers. But some are more dangerous than others in that they are even more likely to be set off either accidentally or more likely to be set off deliberately. That's rarely uh, mentioned than other weapons are. Uh, these are the single weapons that create the pressure that one sees about in movies and uh, articles and so forth that show the president supposed to be making a decision at three in the morning. Uh, which I remember Hillary Clinton saying we, who, the, the uh, criterion for president between her and Obama at the time was which one had the experience to wake up at three in the morning and make a decision whether to end civilization or not. Now, obviously, the answer should never be yes, and it doesn't matter which one gives that order. However, the only reason that the uh, president is, is ever pressed uh, for making a decision within minutes uh, with such unprecedented world-ending consequences are the ICBMs. They are vulnerable to attack. And if there's tactical warning of attack, that is that missiles are on the way or about to be sent, and we have this vastly expensive warning system uh, designed to provide minutes of warning on that. Uh, the idea, the only reason that the president is called upon to make a decision within minutes about that is that he has to use his ICBMs or lose them. And well, if he loses them, in reality, what difference will that make if missiles are actually on the way? Uh, what difference will it make whether he sends missiles in response or not? And the answer is none. Uh, however, the entire system is set up uh, to almost to force his hand if he gets information that is irrefutable, uh, let's say, that it's uh, terribly convincing. And unfortunately, such false alarms have been given and were given the lie only just in time before a response was made. So the very existence of these weapons then uh, pushes him to use them supposedly to limit damage in the war, to uh, destroy whatever missiles the other side has not yet sent, you know, which is obviously a feckless task, except that we have spent upwards of a trillion dollars to, to allow him to make that decision. And finally, if he got those ICBMs off the board, if he had no such thing, and relied only on the equally murderous Trident submarines, uh, there's no pressure for a fast response or even for a sole presidential response because they are invulnerable. They can, uh, they can wait really a year or more uh, under sea. Uh, their normal their normal cruise is several months, but uh, they actually could stay under uh, for a very long time. And should they ever be should they ever launch their missiles? No, but at least they are not putting any pressure on a president to uh, use those missiles for which we've spent so much money uh, yeah. and rehearsed so many times right away. There is no such pressure, even. Planes, bombers uh, can be launched 
uh, on call, on a positive control, they're called, where they don't go ahead to target unless they're given a positive, definite further signal by somebody to, to go on, and otherwise uh, they're not to go on. So again, they don't pose this particular danger. These ICBMs should never have been built in a world in which, even from the point of view of cold warriors and hawks and nuclear hawks, the, the alternative of submarine launch missiles, which you know, pose all of their own problems also, but which don't pose this problem of vulnerability, which uh, compels a very fast and obviously absurdly inadequate time to make any kind of decision. Uh, we should never have built these missiles. We should have gotten rid of them <clears throat> any year of the last 50 years and more. Yeah. And uh, there's no excuse for them. There's no incentive for them except for Air Force budget and, above all, profits of corporations like Northrop Grumman. Earlier, it was mainly Boeing that produced these. And everything that flows from those sales, uh, jobs, which they mentioned very explicitly, as a reason to prepare uh, to have these very dangerous weapons, which I've said are a hair trigger on the doomsday machine, uh, compelling a very fast decision under various circumstances, and at the same time, a lightning rod, because they are vulnerable to Russian attack, and a Russian false alarm uh, invites the Russians to use theirs or lose them, and to use them against what? Against our ICBMs take away those targets, and I can list what other targets exist, none of them urgent for the Russians, hardly any. The reason the Russian uh, force is as large as it is, or the rationale for it, is the same as the reason for ours, to correspond to the other side's set of targets. Yeah. Take those off the board, and uh, the rationale for uh, on either side for these, these, these huge number of weapons disappears. That doesn't mean that the pressure disappears for them because the profits are there, the jobs are there, the donations, in our case, to Congress. And now they have them, maybe even in Russia nowadays, which on the one hand is as capitalist as we are, and on the other hand has a, has a legislature, which is pretty much rubber stamp like ours. But it just occurs to me as I say this, uh, it may be worth bribing them too on their from their military industrial complex, uh, their their parliament, their uh, uh, legislature. So in any case, the those are the incentives: yeah. jobs, profits, donations, in and out jobs for the for the military, uh, and for that, civilization is is hanging by a thread. Uh, just to be clear, not that anyone could possibly have missed the point, but to spell out ICBM, it's Intercontinental Ballistic Missile, uh, yeah, meaning yeah. it's land-based, not it's, it doesn't move around in the water or the air, so it's a target. Right. Um, and, it's, and since uh, on both sides they worked at increasing accuracy so as to hit these uh, missiles which are in concrete silos and which have very heavy blast doors on top of them, so they can only be destroyed by very accurate missiles. Well, both sides work very hard to make them that accurate, and to make the other side's missiles vulnerable. They both succeeded, and so both sides are cooperating in, uh, as I said earlier, uh, to use uh, John F. Kennedy's very apt metaphor, a sword of Damocles hanging by a thread and making that thread thinner and thinner all the time. Uh, that's where we are. And if the United States or Russia were to find the nerve or the decency or the creative uh, generation of more humane and sane jobs programs than death machine jobs programs, it, it would take a nice excuse away from the other side, right? If, if, if Russia got yes. rid of all theirs, we could go to Washington with an additional argument for why it's insane to be keeping those of the United States, right? Yeah. It's not, the argument is usually made on grounds that they're unnecessary in view of the submarine missiles that we have, uh, <coughs> uh, or and wasteful, given by, by the fact that they can't target the other side's submarine missiles, which means that whether they're used or not makes almost no difference. Uh, the submarine missiles alone will, will cause no nuclear winter 
if they're actually launched on either side, let alone both. So they're necessary, they're wasteful, but the argument is not made which I think needs to be really pressed home. They're dangerous in a way. If you if you kept those jobs, uh, as I've said in the article, and not in a joke at all, actually, that our security would be better to pay the workers and even the directors, the profit makers of Northrop Grumman, pay them just as much not to make these missiles. That would improve our security, our, as opposed to making new ones, which they've just budgeted to do. But some of that money, in a small fraction, should be used to get the existing missiles out of the ground, fill the silos with concrete, so they're no longer targets for the Russians. They do not present the Russians, then, with a, with a need to get theirs off the ground fast. Yeah. They're not under threat from our missiles, and they have no targets. So to answer you directly, David, it's not intuitive, but I could work it through, uh, given more time than we have here, to show that pretty much you increase our security uh, enormously if just one side gets rid of its missiles. Better both. That's definitely better. But uh, most of the benefit is from, uh, I, I could show in an argument, is from getting rid of one side. The Russians aren't going to do it because they are afraid of our anti-submarine warfare, which essentially they don't have against ourselves. We do have against their subs, partly for geographic reasons. We're able to track them in a way that they can't do. So they don't want to rely on their submarines, which also have a bad habit of exploding, getting on fire, going to the bottom yeah. of the ocean. And uh, they, they, so, so long as missile, as uh, they do rely on uh, nuclear weapons at all for deterrence, they're probably not going to get rid of their ICBMs. We can, and that's not just half the problem. That's most of the problem. Yeah. If uh, if we if we got rid of ours. Is and what are the holdups? Is one of the holdups the congressional so-called representatives and and senators from these west northwestern yeah. states in the United States? Do we need? a creative investment in, obviously they won't la openly pay people to do nothing, but what if we put the money into conversion to green energy or healthcare or something actually useful, more jobs and tons of them for these states, uh, would, that, would that make a difference? All, all experience shows from base closings that it's possible to provide local, with planning and transition work on this, to provide more cho more jobs than you had before the base was closed. That we, that's been done very many times when bases have been closed. Now, granted, especially facing this Congress <clears throat> and Republicans, the people there who are... Uh, in the vicinity of these missiles, uh, buying real estate for homes, uh, buying uh, takeout food, and whatever. By the way, that's literally mentioned as uh, one of the when you interview people in Minot, North Dakota, as why they like a base in their vicinity. They talk about the crew members getting the takeout on their way to the uh, to the silo, and <clears throat> and uh, in general, you know, beefing up the local economy now. That's money in the hand. They don't necessarily count on getting that. So there is that resistance. You know, this is what we're getting. This is our jobs. We're not sure you're going to give us any other jobs. And there's some reason for that. But uh, could you do it? Absolutely. And when I say pay them for doing nothing, that sounds silly. But except uh, think of it as, as transition, as unemployment insurance for the jobs, for the jobs while they are trained for other jobs, while other jobs are brought into the community, transportation costs, if needed, to, to take them elsewhere. This money has to be, has to be uh, provided, basically, if you're, to, if you're to get the political will to get rid of these. But, and <laughs> here's the hard part, you somehow have to find something else for Northrop Grumman to make its bloated profits on, because otherwise... They make enough to buy Congress to keep themselves at work. Yeah, and to and buy the uh, rest of Congress, it's, it's, which could outvote it, the members from these handful of states if yeah. they wanted to, right? If, if they wanted to. Now, here's something, David, I, I, I haven't seen anybody else mention. First of all, most people are not at all aware, naturally, that there is such a thing as an IB, ICBM 
caucus or cabal, or they now call it coalition, an ICBM coalition in Congress. Mm. People who regularly lobby the president and their other fellow members uh, with letters, with lobbying, with visits on the strategic need for these missiles to be kept on hot alert, meaning seven days a week, 24 hours a day, uh, uh, ready to go, because that's more money locally uh, to do it. Now, what nobody has pointed to is that the members of the ICBM caucus, which is quite small, it's usually 10 senators in the Senate, consist exactly of the people who have missiles in their state. Yeah. That's uh, uh, basically three states where there are bases, uh, Wyoming, Montana, North Dakota, plus Utah, where they service the missiles to a large extent, sometimes plus Louisiana, where they have stealth bombers and so forth. Uh, that's all. What, what the point I'm saying I, I've never seen anybody else make is, isn't it interesting that they haven't found one other senator outside uh, the states where they get local jobs to agree with them? on this strategic necessity. You know, if, if, so, if it's so strategically urgent, you, you would think they could get somebody else who wasn't, in effect, being paid directly to say this. But, uh, or, you know, it depends on it, on their, on their jobs and their unions in the local, in the local business. I think but they are And some of them are but... just very open about it, the jobs mentioned by the, uh, the jobs tester, who's uh, the one Democrat. Mm -hmm. yeah, the, the others happen to be in lightly populated states, Montana, North Dakota, uh, which are Republican. But John Tester, uh, who's also very big on um, fossil fuels in general, key person, he's chairman of the subcommittee on these, on these weapons. And uh, he's from Montana, where they have uh, Maelstrom Air Force Base. And it's as open as that. I'm following this series, uh, Dope Sick, in the air. There's been four episodes so far of eight coming, about the Sackler family and how cynically open they were at pushing, as dope pushers, pushing OxyContin on the country for use against headaches and uh, uh, arthritis pains and everything, for which it works, but at the cost of getting addicted and dying uh, uh, for this. the No one going to, to jail for this, but the Sackler family critical in uh, the 500,000 deaths or so that have come along. Mm -hmm. Now, how cynical can you get? Uh, well, look at the tobacco companies. There's plenty of precedent for this. But I want to say now to get people aware, look at Northrop Grumman, Lockheed, Boeing, General Dynamics, uh, Raytheon, those are the main five yeah. uh, that do this, that have been pushers of this dangerous uh, weapon, which uh, uh, threatens the survival of humanity. Yeah, and it's clearly not just the jobs. It's revealing how much it is the jobs, but it's also the campaign bribes or what they call contributions because those other 90 senators who they can't get into their caucus uh, are not doing anything uh, to eliminate the ICBM. Uh, and so it, it, it's, it, it seems like it, it, it's... A woman in Congress who's very, very experienced in this uh, told me, um, might be embarrassed her if I, if I name her, so I won't, but no one more experienced says, in, introduce me the idea of when a senator says, I need this in my state for jobs, and of course votes go with the jobs and union support and various things, other senators will not oppose him, except for un, very unusual reasons. This is log rolling or let's say pork barrel rolling. They won't oppose that because they need the other person's votes for their states when they, you know, when they need to uh, get pork and unnecessary and dangerous material in their own state. In other words, that's a, a very winning argument uh, of the jobs. At the same time, remember, they're not. You could get more jobs. You could get more jobs from solar panels, from education, from health. You would get far more jobs if you put that money into almost anything else than this. But so the jobs is just it's just a cover. Even it's like, Dan, a very any, Republican it's a cover for the profits, a very Republican friendly argument. Even you get more jobs from not taxing the money from working people in the first place. 
You get That's right. Puffs. So the, the, the jobs is just a uh, it's just a selling point from Northrop Grumman. In fact, they greatly exaggerate the number of jobs. They say ten thousand, which is I think well, some tiny fraction of one percent of uh, the jobs in the country. But uh, they're in these lately populated states where it does make a difference to Great Falls, Montana, Minot, North Dakota. It's a significant part of their of their uh, job. But obviously, you could do with uh, without that. The real incentive, and this is not confined to these 10 senators, the real incentive is the campaign donations uh, that they get, the um, uh, lobbying that goes on, the in and out uh, from uh, uh, the Pentagon. Our current Secretary of Defense comes straight from Raytheon. He was preceded by uh, Esper, who came straight from a life in Boeing. And uh, then they go back. Yeah. And the other party comes in and they're out of office. They go back to the boards yeah. and others. So their perception of what's good for the country, uh, you're not old enough to remember directly you know, when the Secretary of Defense, who had been head of GM, uh, got in trouble when he said long ago, what's good for GM is good for the country. Actually, what he said was, what's good for the country is good for GM and vice versa. But that was usually translated as, What's good for GM is good for the country. Yeah. And that's what they think. And that's how they think. So they're being patriotic. It's good for the country. For us to make a profit, in part, and this is not a joke, this is very explicit, in part to keep a healthy aerospace industry in case you needed it sometime. Yeah. You, uh, for World War II, in case we had another conventional World War II. But uh, even Vietnam and Iraq do very well by the aerospace industry. Not one of those wars should have been held since World War II. We have an argument about World War II. But I am with you, David, absolutely. Every war since then has done nothing for our security, has killed many, many people, millions we're talking about, absolutely wrongly, murderously. And uh, the aerospace industries have done very well in those. They're lost wars, but they make as, as much money in those. In fact, if they're stalemated and go on forever, they make more money if the war was, was cut off. Yeah, we, we are speaking with Daniel Ellsberg, whose recent article in The Nation magazine with Norman Solomon is called To Avoid Armageddon, Don't Modernize Missiles, Eliminate Them. Uh, the thing about these profits for these weapons dealers, uh, they do them good in the short run, but if we all die, they die too. They're on the same planet. And there's a lot of conversation about the danger of climate collapse, of ecosystem collapse, of environmental catastrophe and virtual silence in our culture, in our media, about nuclear apocalypse and Armageddon, even though it's a greater risk now than ever before, according to the scientists and experts. Why, why is that? Why? I, I mean, the U.S. Senate won't take action on either one. You know, I mean, we need to abolish the U.S. Senate, first of all, the things we're going to abolish. But, but why is one a, a, an acceptable topic of conversation and the other unheard of? Yeah, that's a, that's a, it is the case. First, what you're saying is exactly right. Since the end of the Cold War, certainly, which is more than 30 years ago now, um, people thought the need for the weapons has gone away. Surely the weapons have gone away also. Uh, I remember when I, uh, Norman Solomon and I actually got arrested together protesting a Minuteman uh, test in California here. Uh, got arrested. And <clears throat> the purpose of it was to kind of remind people that this was still going on and that it, it should be ended. But I remember very well from that occasion, a lot of people reacted, we still have ICBMs? You know, but wait a minute, this is long after the Cold War, right? Uh, we still have missiles. They don't know it. In fact, you weren't you weren't wasting time to spell out what that meant. Uh, intercontinental ballistic missile. And uh, even so, it takes a little more than that to realize that you have in a hole in the ground, people waiting with uh, uh, their own hole, their, commo their command module, module, a button to push, in fact, down there. 
to send off a missile, which any one of which will, uh, at the least, any one of those warheads will, will be close to half a World War II in its explosive power. And uh, as I say, bad as it is to have any of those, ones that are tempt the president to say, look, this missile that we've spent so much for, a lot, really, and we prepared and we've rehearsed actually sending it off, you may be about to lose those. What are you going to do, Mr. President? And as Bruce Blair has pointed out, that system has been rehearsed in such a way, as he says, to jam the president, to make it almost impossible that they make any other answer but to uh, to send off those missiles, despite the fact that they are condemning humanity to nuclear winter, which comes from the burning cities and the smoke that is lofted into the stratosphere. The discovery of that in 1983, uh, well over 30 years ago, uh, <coughs> has had no effect on our planning. So we come to the larger question, uh, why isn't this a problem? Well, let's go back to your other point. The climate is getting about as much attention as you could want. It's, you know, there's the International Summit that's coming up now. There's uh, Greta Thunberg with millions of young people on the streets on Friday taking a strike. You, you, can't, you can't say it's not getting enough attention. And what action is it getting? As Greta Thunberg uh, says resolutely every time, don't say we're succeeding because we're putting people on the street. The test is emissions, and the fossil fuel emissions are going up. You're paying no attention to us, whatever, as if the voice wasn't being said. So that doesn't uh, promise a lot for getting nuclear weapons the kind of attention they really used to have in, in the early 80s. We don't have it now. But say they did. W climate doesn't give us any in indication that we in the streets, and which is necessary, necessary, and I'll be, and I'm part of it. We have one minute. part of it. Yeah, uh, that that will do the job. But uh, actually, we've got a species problem here. On the one hand, the megaphone of the people who make concentrated profit out of this and, and bribe people with it does outweigh our voice to a considerable extent. In the case of climate, you can the word is exon, the corresponding word in nuclear to Lockheed or Northrop Grumman. We don't hear those things very much. But yeah. there is a species problem also in terms when they do hear it of putting short-term jobs and profits, and this is not just for the corporate boards now, it's for the people, for the voters, putting that so far ahead of their grandchildren's problem. That's in the future. Let's take care of that. Maybe technology will take care of it some way. So we have a very big problem, which we as humans probably won't solve, and yet it's not impossible to turn this around. Nobody can say it's impossible. No. And while it's possible, you and I, David, will be doing all we can to change course. I think you're doing as much as anyone on this little planet. Dan Ellsberg, I appreciate all of your work, and thank you very, very much for coming on Talk World Radio. And back to you, David. Same here. Bye. And take action at rootsaction.org. Help end war at worldbeyondwar.org. Read or listen to today's Peace Almanac entry at peacealmanac.org. All past shows can be heard at talkworldradio.org. Talk World Radio is produced in Charlottesville, Virginia, and syndicated by Pacifica Network. There is no way to peace. Peace is the way.